Well, I had the most incredibly happy and privileged childhood, James, to be honest. And it's one of the things that's driven me to do the things that I do now, because I was brought up in Edinburgh, so I'm Scottish even though I've lost my accent over the last 40 years or so. So not many people pick it up other than those who come from Scotland. And I went to a private school. I went to that school at the age of three. Amazingly, I left at the age of 19. So I stayed at the same school for my entire education. Of course, that's got both pluses and minuses, but I look back on it and all the things that I did, whether that was sport very keen on sport, whether it was arts, whether that was culture, it was all made available to me. And as I look at today's British children, by and large, they don't have the opportunities that I had. And so I'm sure we'll come on to it. But that's a very important driver for me uh, in terms of the work I do now. From Coordinate Sports, it's The Drive Phase, a show about sports founders, leaders and experts and the stories behind their business journeys. Our guest in this episode is David Gregson independent, non-executive board member and chairman. David has spent his career leading and supporting successful organizations. He combines a keen focus around commerce, education, government, and sports with a passion for social justice to impact over 30 organizations, including the LTA, London 2012 Legacy, the Invictus Games, and the FA Women's Super League. Later this year, David is launching the Manchester Wellbeing Project, a study to understand the well-being of all children in Manchester and the many challenges they face growing up today. During the episode, David talks us through his school life and early career, to founding the private equity firm Phoenix and setting the ethical culture that remains to this day. We also hear about his thoughts on the education system and whether it is still fit for purpose in the 21st century. So get a pen and paper ready to take some notes so many insights in this episode. Enjoy the show. It's okay, so very pleased to welcome uh, David Gregson to the show today. David is an independent non-executive board member and chair and has held positions across over 30 organizations in commerce, education, government and sport. Currently council member with the Foundation for Education Development and executive committee member of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, among many others. Specifically in sport, he's former chair of LTA and the London 2012 Legacy Board and currently holding positions with the Invictus Games and FA Women's Super League. So really lucky to have you on today, David, and welcome to the show. Thanks for the lovely introduction, James. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to get everything in that you do and, and you've done a really studied uh, resume. But I guess what we're trying to do today is going to hear a bit about your journey to, to where you are today. Normally, we start off back in school or in childhood. Um, so if I could take you back, how would you describe your child in uh, well, I had the most incredibly happy and privileged childhood, James, to be honest. And it's one of the things that's driven me to do the things that I do now because I was brought up in Edinburgh. So I'm Scottish, even though I've lost my accent over the last 40 years or so. So not many people pick it up other than those who come from Scotland. And I went to a private school. I went to that school at the age of three. Amazingly, I left at the age of 19. So I stayed at the same school for my entire education. Of course, that's got both pluses and minuses. But I look back on it and all the things that I did, whether that was sport, very keen on sport, whether it was arts, whether that was culture, it was all made available to me. And as I look at today's British children, by and large, they don't have the opportunities that I had. And so I'm sure we'll come on to it. But that's a very important driver for me. Uh, in terms of the work I do now. In school, you said you were there from well, your whole childhood. Was that a boarding environment or were you just day, day school? No, it wasn't a boarding environment. We did have a small number of boarders, but it was a day, day school. So I was lucky enough to be able to walk to school. And I walked back to the playing fields to play cricket, rugby. Everybody had to play rugby at, at my school. There was no option. Squash, tennis, it was all made available. A short walk away from the school and a short walk away from home. That's the end going to talk uh, on extensively on childhood well-being later on but in terms of you mentioned sport then it was almost a given that you would participate in rugby were you talented or was it just something that was kind of I guess did you enjoy sport and was that what driver for you or was it that it was just part of what you had to do well I think the rugby was part of what I had to do because we're not all good at all sports are we so I happened to be captain of the third 15 for three consecutive years and our record was lamentable so nobody could say that I was a good rugby player but I was I started off with tennis and then I met a squash coach and he converted my tennis into squash so I then became a very enthusiastic squash player and played for Scotland juniors 
And then I took up cricket and played for Scotland juniors at cricket too. So I learned millions of things through playing sport, not only what it was like to win, but also what it was like to lose, which we did all the time in the rugby team. Yeah, normally that's the theme in terms of if you have a good first experience in sport, it generally carries through into adolescence, later life, you are actually an active adult. So that's something obviously we'll probably touch on with uh, the conversation later on. So coming out of private school there, coming out, leaving at 18, 19, you went on to uh, Cambridge, was it, and studied there? I did. I struggled at Cambridge, to be honest with you, James. Was it maths degree, yeah? Yeah, maths and physics. So uh, maybe was it down to that choice? or <laughs> It's one of those subjects that you can either do or you can't. I could do it at school, but I struggled at university. Many of you may have seen a, a film called The Theory of Everything, which has featured Stephen Hawking's. Stephen Hawking was discovering black holes when I was at Cambridge, and he was a professor of physics at Cambridge when I was there. And we were learning about his discoveries two or three years after he was discovering them himself. I never had a lecture from him. But you can tell that the level at which we were being taught was on a different platform from what I'd learned at school. But nevertheless, you learn everything from all of these things. And I got through it. I worked incredibly hard. I didn't find it natural, but I got my degree and I learned that you could achieve lots of things if you work hard, even if you're not natural. Yeah, and I guess the decision to go into maths and physics, was that kind of what you were looking at doing in leaving school, going to university? Did you have an eye on a certain career, engineering? Well, it's a super fine question, actually, because I think looking back in those days, this was in the 1970s, I don't think career guidance and reflecting on who you are as a young person and what you want to do was anything like as pervasive as it is today. So that's a great development, I think, in the way young people have been brought up today. So I think it, I felt as I look back that it was a bit of a preordained journey. You know, I was at private school. I was expected to go to a good university. I happened to study those subjects at A-level. And so it was natural that I would go on to study them at university. I'm not sure that I reflected broadly enough as to whether I was suited to study them or not. Yeah, and I was just curious. I don't know whether you inspired to build rockets or anything like that. <laughs> you know, you start going there. Um, no, but equally, I did study astronomy. So you, you tend to specialize whatever course you do at university. And I've mentioned Stephen Hawking's and he was discovering black holes. So I did do a lot of work in astronomy. And so I still find that later in life a fascination. And you may have seen the Perseverance rover on Mars. Uh, you know, so I do look at that stuff and think, gosh, that's exciting. And then the first unmanned flight on Mars took place a couple of days ago. Yeah, I get excited about that stuff. Can I understand it? Probably no more than you, I suspect, or anybody else. No, exactly. I've been a bit of a renaissance in space travel at the moment. So, yeah, it's a good time to be interested in that. So, moving on from obviously, you've got your degree. And I know we normally talk about really interested in kind of that transition into where you are today. And I know you started off teaching. And I don't know whether that was a, a conscious decision or was it something you kind of fell into and moved out of? No, I think that one, unlike studying maths and physics, that one was more conscious. As I said, I'd sort of found Cambridge incredibly hard work. I played lots of sports. So, I played for the university at both cricket and, and squash. And so it was a full life. And I felt I came from a family where my father was a great industrialist. He was a, a businessman. And it was therefore natural for me to follow a business career, which I ended up doing. But I thought before I did so that I would go and get some experience somewhere else. And so I ended up being a teacher at a school in New Zealand, which was the most incredible year. And so I was a teacher for a year. I absolutely loved it. They asked me to stay and I was tempted to do so. But in the end, I came back to the job I'd already agreed to accept before I left New Zealand, which was a, with a big packaging company, one of the largest companies in the UK at the time called Metal Box. And so I did come back, but it was a marvelous year. And that sowed the seeds, I think, for my interest of working with young people, mentoring young people, teaching young people. And you are interested, obviously, you got your early career there. And was that in manufacturing? Yeah. In the UK? Yeah. You moved on to become a venture capitalist, private equity firm, launching Phoenix. Where did that come from? Was that something you always wanted to do? Or was it just coming out and seeing the opportunity as you're working in industry and moving into it? Well, it's a great question, James. So I haven't asked myself that for a very long time. So I would say that, first of all, I ended up working in North Wales for Metal Box. And I did that for nearly three years. It was at a time when Margaret Thatcher had just come into power. It was in the late 70s, and she was going through a very significant restructuring of the economy, notably with the coal miners. And I mention this because it meant that all of British industry at the time went on to a three-day week, including me. I was forced onto a three-day week. 
And I thought, well, gosh, I'm not sure I particularly want to be on a three-day week for too much longer. So I decided to retrain. And I went and studied at Manchester Business School. That particular experience sowed a bit like many of the other experiences I've had with some of the things that I've done since I'm now on the board of Manchester Business School. But I did an MBA at Manchester, and that opened my eyes to the opportunities and the interest in investing. So my first role after Manchester, it was a two-year program, was to work for a small venture capital firm in Bristol called Dartington & Co. I then moved to London to work for a much bigger investment vehicle. And then in the early 90s, set up my own firm called Phoenix, which you referred to. I know your, I guess your mission at Phoenix was, was slightly different based on ethical investing, is it, if I'm right. So would you think, I guess, would you class yourselves back then as kind of the first impact investor? Does that make sense? Is that kind of what you're in, investing in? Or? Well, obviously, impact investing didn't exist in those days. And I don't think that um, even Phoenix would say they were impact investors even today. However, what it does differentiate Phoenix today and what I hope differentiated Phoenix in the way that we set it up, and it was myself and a group of colleagues who did so in the early 90s, was the way we did business. And for a, for a sector which is renowned for being very financially motivated, quite aggressive, it has those caricatures. I hope that if people were to ask about, uh, around about Phoenix, they would say there were really strong ethical values that underpin the way Phoenix does business. And actually, if you go onto the Phoenix website, Today, you'll see the four or five values that underpin the way that Phoenix tries to do business. That doesn't mean, nevertheless, though, that we didn't seek to make significant investment returns from the investments that we made, because we did, and we still do, because the funders who provide the money to Phoenix are financially motivated. They're pension funds. They have return requirements of their own. So I think on that point about impact, it's more about the way we did business rather than the impact that we wanted to have on the wider environment, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And was that a challenge then to kind of set yourselves up in that way? I guess I might have my, my timings wrong, but I guess the, the wider landscape at that time was that kind of the rise of hostile takeovers, et cetera. Was it for you to set up with a slightly different approach? Was that a big challenge for you to explain to the funders, I guess? That's a great question, James, because you have got your timings pretty right, because around that time, KKR, the, what, you know, one of the early founders of Leverage Buyouts, made a hostile bid for RJR Nabisco. These were very, you know, the largest leverage buyout done at the time. So this was very much the approach of a lot of particularly the North American funders. But I think it's true of any leader, um, where with every, whichever sector they're in, the business that you create reflects who you are. And so I didn't look at the market and say, oh, gosh, there's a gap for somebody who's going to create a private equity group that looks like this. I, I didn't, I have to admit it. But what I did do is I set up with colleagues Phoenix with a culture that reflected who I was and who we were. And so doing big leveraged buyouts wasn't what we were about. However, supporting in partnership executives, great executives, industry leading executives to grow their business, aligning their interests with ours and making significant funds together, but doing it in a culturally ethical way. That's what we sought to do. You know, I'd like to think that reflects all of the norms that have underpinned my career both before and since. Yeah, I think that'll resonate with, with anyone who's starting a business. I think it's the kind of legacy you leave in if, you, if you're uh, good to do business with and you've got certain ethics and it's, it's, um, it's always the positive. So you were with or launched and, and grew Phoenix right up until was it 2010, 2012? Was it? Because I'm trying to it's thinking it's dovetails with the Olympics, doesn't it? I think that's what I was trying to, trying to move on to sports. I'm trying to get a nice, smooth transition. But <laughs> Well, you've done that pretty well. I started to reduce my time commitment to Phoenix in the early 2000s, actually. And I started to do lots of different things, not really in sport at that time. And there have been sort of three things which have underpinned the th what I've done in my sort of post-Phoenix career. One is an interest in the environment. One is an interest in young people that we've touched upon already. And another is an interest in social justice. And funnily enough, sport encompasses a lot of that, which is why it's attractive. So I agreed with my colleagues at Phoenix in the early 2000s that I would steadily reduce my time to Phoenix and start to do these other things. And I became chairman of the London 2012 legacy in 2008. 
And of course, the, the Olympic Games didn't take place until four years later. But one of the great successes of London 2012 was that it was so well planned. And Boris Johnson, who became the mayor of London in 2008, was the inspiration, interestingly, for setting up a legacy vehicle four years ahead of time. And I became chairman of that for a couple of years and stayed on as a board member for a further eight. So I was involved in the Olympic legacy for 10 years, stepping down in 2018. And then in 2013, or the end of 2012, so just after the end of the 2012 Olympics, I became chairman of the LTA. Uh, so obviously, I got the interest in, in the power sport, which I've retained since. And you've mentioned I'm now on the board of English Women's Football. Definitely. I guess in terms of tennis, I guess you still had that interest from schools and have carried through and an interest in that. I'm always interested in when you're taking up these roles and, and essentially heading up the LTA and looking at how you develop tennis. Which is, I guess that's always been a challenge in terms of grassroots tennis growing and challenges recently. What do you see in terms of your time at the LTA and from, I guess, distance travelled from when you joined to where it was when you left? And what would be the highlights for you? That's another great question. Yeah, I was chairman for six years. And I think the first thing to say is that to be chairman of a big governing body of a major sport, there are five major professional sports in Britain, and tennis is one of them, the others being cricket, rugby union, rugby league, and football. And so, first of all, six years is an incredible length of time because sport is so all-encompassing. It's in every aspect of our lives. We're seeing it just as we talked about before we started at the moment with the, with the discussions on the European Super League. So the first thing I would say is that it becomes almost the core of your life for that six-year period. I think in terms of why I became chair of the LTA, it was because of my interest in social justice, actually, which is here was a sport that was considered to be very elitist. And the, the connotations that arise from Wimbledon and grass and strawberries and champagne and all these caricatures that people have of Wimbledon. You know, that's not helpful in terms of growing the sport in Sheffield or anywhere else outside of the Wimbledon bubble. And so I made it my personal aspiration to grow tennis, make it freely available across the country to people who'd never picked up a racket. And we entered all sorts of joint ventures with local authorities, with park operators. And I'm very proud at the end of my time as chairman, we had some 200,000 people who were playing tennis who'd never played tennis before, and they were playing for free. They may well, may well be playing with rackets that the LTA had provided to them. And it was all part of this effort to widen the appeal of the sport, because unless a sport has a broad appeal, it'll die. And that was the challenge I saw at the LTA. I made lots of mistakes. It's hard not to in a sport where there are so many competing objectives, aspirations, and passions. Just touching on the Olympic legacy, I know obviously so much a huge, I guess, once in a lifetime opportunity for sport in the UK. How do you feel that looking back now, I guess you must have had certain strategies and certain metrics that you're working towards at that point. Do you feel like you've achieved against those? I mean, in the internal perspective, you probably know what you were setting out to do. Well, in fairness, the Olympic legacy vehicle that I was chairman of and remained a director of was much more about the redevelopment of the area around the Olympic Park. So it wasn't so much, but I mean, I'm happy to talk about it, but it wasn't so much about the physical activity levels, the Inspire a Generation, which was the marvellous phrase that Seb Coe, Keith Mills, Paul Dyson and other colleagues so beautifully put into our sort of lexicon. So what we did in on the Olympic Park is to actually completely redevelop it. I was going to say, you could claim that as a success, right? Yeah, no, no. I think the Olympic legacy and the Olympic Park is considered to be an enormous success. It's not had its own, it's not been without its own challenges. The biggest one being the Olympic Stadium, which is now, as you'll know, being used by West Ham. And I think that's settled down nicely. But we had to redesign the Olympic Stadium to enable a football club to be the core tenant. And it's not as if London is short of major sports venues. So it has to compete with other major sports venues, whether that's Arsenal, whether that's Twickenham, whether that's Lord, there's a lot of them in London. But I think the Olympic Stadium, now called the London Stadium, I should add, has carved that niche with West Ham, doing rather well in the Premiership at the moment, as we know, at its core. But that was probably the biggest challenge, actually. Now, when it comes to inspiring a generation, you know, that became the role of Sport England, which is the government agency, which is there to try and 
increase participation. UK sport is the elite sport agency. And I think, therefore, the question, you know, have we succeeded inspiring a generation? It's pretty hard to say that we definitely have. But then again, you don't know what it would have been like if you hadn't had the Olympics, do you? Yeah, exactly. I guess it depends what metric you use as well. If it's going to be on gold medals, etc., then you probably have. It keeps increasing every games, but that's the elite sport side. Yeah, for sure. I think the Inspire Generation was more about making sure that people became active. You know, grassroots sport. That was the real objective. And that's something something we definitely come on to. I mean, in terms of working in sport for me and, and a lot of my colleagues, I don't almost. I always feel like it almost shows you all the opportunity that's available. So sports an engager, so we know that we can have an impact on so many areas, transferable skills, academic attainment, et cetera, et cetera. And I know you've got a focus on, strong focus on social justice and everything you're part of. And I don't know if this is where it came from, but was that the link, I guess, into what you're doing at the moment with education development and the Manchester Wellbeing Project? Was sport that catalyst or was it kind of running alongside each other? With- I think it's probably more running as alongside each other, I suppose. What I really feel, if we go back to where you started by asking where I went to school, when I described how I'd gone to this private school and had all the advantages that Britain could offer. And it has felt for almost my entire life since as that was fundamentally unfair, that somehow I could be part of this group, very small group, 7% that go to private schools that have all these advantages given to them through no achievement of their own. And so the whole point about equality and Fairness has been a very important driver to me, hence raising up the standards and facilities and quality of life in East London through the London Olympic, hence making tennis far more freely available to people who've never had the chance to try something which they consider to be out of their reach, hence becoming chairman of the UK's largest social care charity, dealing with those ravaged with substance misuse families across the country. They're the theme. And then I did a review of the prison service as well. So I think they're they're the theme of, I think sport goes across them all because sport is a great leveler. You don't have to have been to a private school to be a great, great sports person. And I think they were in parallel, James, but then of course they do come together in the way that I've described. Yeah, I guess also as well, I mean, leadership positions, you across all these organizations, all these board positions, I guess you're going to see that if you have a discussion around equality, et cetera, or like you said, privilege of being in that position. Normally, I don't know the official stats, but tend to be uh, people in those roles might be coming from the same background as yourself to get into those roles. Do you feel like that was a, is that a fair comment to say? <laughs> in leadership in sport or in organizations generally? Well, I don't know about sport, actually. So I don't have the data to support that. Although I'd be minded to guess that that probably the leadership is comes from a broader array of backgrounds in sport, but I don't know for sure. What I can say is there's lots of research that has been done of other professions, you know, whether that's the legal profession or the accounting profession, or if you look at the backgrounds of the chief executives of major businesses. And it's not to say that those didn't go to private school, can't make it, but the relative weighting of those who did go to private school is much, much higher. And that suggests that this notion of social capital that you benefit from at private school, the self-confidence that comes from doing all these different things really makes a difference. And that's one of the things that I'm absolutely determined to change across England in the coming decade or so to give more self-confidence, more self-esteem, more opportunity to young people and to mirror what those from more privileged backgrounds naturally get. I guess it's almost that imposter syndrome for people not from that background. If they rise up to achieve that, then they might feel like they're not confident to be in the, in the room, if that makes sense. I don't know if I'm sticking this down. It does. A really interesting point to make, James, because you know one of the things that I'm privileged to do is I mentor and coach senior executives. And one of them was exactly as you've described. If you stand back and look at what he'd done, it was exceptional by any standards. But just because of his background, I don't think he really felt that he deserved it. That has changed. I mean, you know, we've spent so much time talking about it together. You know, he's now very, very comfortable that he deserves absolutely to be where he is. His intellect is second to none. But he started off in that position of not thinking he deserved it. For anyone I know, I guess moving on to education, current education system, and I guess everyone's got an opinion on the education system, and (laughs) we all want to hear yours, I guess. So how do you feel in terms of where we are at the moment in terms of the UK education system, primarily, obviously, 
talk about state schools or the combination of the two. What's, um, what's your take on it as we, are, as we stand? Yeah, it's like sport. Everybody's got an opinion because we all went to school. And so we've all got an opinion, haven't we? Now, the first thing to say is that actually, sadly, it's not UK education, it's English education, because education has devolved. So the Welsh have a particular approach to education, the Scottish have their approach to education. And those two actually are quite similar to each other, as happens. And they prioritise the well-being of young people in a way that we don't yet in England. And so when I look at the education system in England... I see a system for which many, many highly regarded changes have been made, improvements in standards, particularly in London, where money has been spent, the rest of the country perhaps less, less so, but it has shown what by real focus can be achieved. I suppose what has also happened is that if anything, due to the Michael Gove reforms, which he undertook with Dominic Cummings, the focus on academic attainment has become even stronger, which I personally think is not a helpful trend. As a result, the ability for young people to benefit from a wider ranges of experiences, because schools themselves are measured against attainment results, five A stars to C at GCSE, that is the one measure that is also unhelpful. And I think there have been pluses and minuses in the way that the school system has been restructured. You may recall that the academy movement started by trying to persuade philanthropists to put money into the education system and take ownership of and help direct schools. It has now become a whole movement. And now I think it's something like 75% of all secondary schools are academies. And if you're an academy, you're outside of the local authority education system. And so the only thing that you need to do is to deliver your education services, if you like, that meet the two things. Firstly, an Ofsted inspection, so it's a regulatory environment, and then secondly, the exam system. So it's a very atomized system now where schools are able to do very much their own thing. And, you know, that can be good and that can be bad. There are pluses and minuses with that. I'm not saying that's at all, all bad because many, many schools have prospered, but it makes it quite much more difficult to do things consistently across the country. So in terms of affecting like national curriculum, affecting change that in that sense, is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean, there is a national curriculum, but actually uh, schools don't have to, there are certain aspects of the national curriculum they've got to stick by, but as long as they deliver on the GCSEs and the A-levels and any other national SATs, they've got flexibility. Again, that's a good thing. I mean, Sir Kevin Collins, who's become the recovery commissioner, is all about empowering schools, and I agree with him. Equally, I think it may just have gone a little bit further than it might have done. And certainly the economies of scale that I think were envisaged by the creation of these academy trusts hasn't been quite achieved. There are 140 academy schools in Greater Manchester, but they are within 55 academy trusts. So at the size of an academy trust on average in Greater Manchester is two to three schools. So there aren't that many economies of scale that you can achieve with a group of that size in a city region. And I know we said about the focus on attainment um, potentially being a negative. Would you say that's around the almost the pressure on teachers to to focus on kind of a a smaller area or or just on attainment? Or is it more, I guess, the pupils, the wider well-being of the pupils or the wider um, education rather than just getting their results? looking at everything else, every other aspect of development, it maybe doesn't get focused on? But. Well, I think, gosh, it's, a, it's such a complicated subject, isn't it, James? And, uh, you know, where do you start on this one? I think that if you start with the overarching structure of it, if you, as I've learned in my business career, if you measure the effectiveness of anything according to only one measure, which is what we do with our education system, A stars to C at GCSE, If you measure according to to only one measure, I think you'll get behaviours which lead to de-emphasis of physical activity, de-emphasis of culture, very much training to the exam, because that's the assessment under which schools are. And I couldn't possibly blame school uh, for wanting to take that approach. But in a world where businesses, employers, and young people themselves actually want something different, It feels as if we need to rethink our education system. And what are we preparing our young people for? 
are we preparing them for the exams, which actually candidly, the exams that you took, James, and the exams that I took 20 or 30 years before you, they're probably almost the same. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. But the employment environment, the economy is completely different. Different again for me, different again for the next generation. Yeah. I mean, goodness me, the iPhone didn't exist until 2007. That was only 14 years ago. Just imagine what's going to be like in 14 years. So we're trying to design something for a future that we don't have any clue on. And yet we still have an exam system and a regulatory system, which has been pretty much unchanged for 60 or 70 years. And I think what is good about the current discussion post or tail end of COVID is that everybody is now starting to focus on is this now fit for purpose for the future? And I think looking at it from a physical activity um, perspective, you can see, I guess, almost see how important it has been with, during the lockdown with the children being kind of locked down, their well-being suffered, activity levels suffered, health metrics are all um, through the floor. So it's almost it's great for our listeners and, and what they're doing. It kind of validates their purpose, I suppose. You mentioned money being spent in London, and that's potentially driven improvement where i guess where and how was that deployed in terms of investment well i don't know it enough actually I, I don't want to intentionally talk that one because I, but i don't know enough about how that was committed but i do know that london is considered to be an exemplar of if you really focus on a geographical area you really can raise standards i might argue they were academic standards rather than broader standards but nevertheless the point about focus and bringing everybody together towards a common objective and aligning interests. I think that's what we saw in London. And it's what I, you know, one aspect of what I hope we'll be able to achieve in Greater Manchester and then more broadly. Final one on, I guess, funding. The PE, PE in school sport had a, has had a lot of funding over the years and the PE premium, um, sugar tax, et cetera, et cetera. Um, currently, there's kind of a delayed announcement, as it was last year, um, just in the news. Delayed announcement to schools to know whether that funding is still in place or whether it's, it's being cut. I don't know what your, what your take is on it in terms of that investment and, and almost the return or, or the measurement against it. Because for myself and the listeners, there's got to be sport. It's transferable, right? The investment in there should increase all other areas. The one that they might be measuring is the children's waistline, et cetera, or activity levels. But really, the focus that it brings and the academic improvements are vast for us. I just don't know what your take would, would be on on that piece. Well, maybe slightly controversially, I think that we spend tough and safe me on uh, on sport. I really do. So I think yeah, well, that won't be controversial with our, with our listeners, but our audience. But I mean, I really, it's 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 tiny, and so it breaks my heart that schools, you know, are, are scrimping and saving on this uh, issue. Now, the reason it might be slightly controversial is, you know, if I look back on my time as at the Olympic legacy and then the LTA. One of the things that I argued for is whether sport as being a member and part of the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, DCMS, makes any sense or not. So you think it should be public health rather than culture? or Well, if you look around the world, which I've done, and see where sport sits, you learn a lot of lessons because I've learned in my business career, everything starts from the top. So if you think, right, well, if it's in in a particular government department, that will drive, because the DCMS is a relatively small department compared to others. And so by definition, therefore, the money coming into sport is likely to be a bit of a patchwork as it is in our country. But if you take the Netherlands, it's the Department of Health and Sport. Well, it makes sense, right, when you hear it like common sense. Yeah. It's so obvious, isn't it? It's just so obvious. So why is it uh, that 85% of all tennis courts in the Netherlands are floodlit? And why is it that the figure is 7% in the United Kingdom? Well, I'd say uh, that the very fact that the local authority is given funding by central government out of the health budget to improve facilities for sports clubs, the length and breadth of the country in order to improve their physical activity levels, you'd argue that that is likely to have a very significant impact. And you see that in the Netherlands, but you see it in France, you see it a little bit in Germany too. And yet we don't have that system at all. It's almost a really simple simple um, equation, if you like. For me, and this has always been my opinion my whole career, is if you could be proactive and, and invest now, then the reactive investment in 
what needs to be spent in the, the NHS or to fix the kind of lifestyle diseases that we have and the figures is minuscule. Like the investment now is nothing compared to what we have to spend on, on healthcare down the line. So it's almost... I don't know, I guess we're having the same, we've got the same opinion on that one, but for me, I, um... <laughs> well, I did a, I did a report actually, because I, I did try and identify some, this is after I left the LTA, and I've written a report which compares physical activity levels and spending, and I estimated, and it was only an estimate, because you can, it's very difficult to pull together, I estimated that the Dutch spend 10 times the amount of money on sport, young people and adults, than we do, and that includes both investment in facilities, and of course, revenue spend in terms of programs. Dutch have also done an assessment as to what the return on investment of that spending is, which, you know, would be better educational outcomes, reduce crime, better employment prospects, lower health costs, you know, it's a mixture. And they estimate that the return on investment is 2.5 to 1. And I think actually, funny enough, Sheffield Hallam have done something quite similar in the UK and come up with something quite similar. So it's interesting, isn't it, that when the return on investment seems to be quite clear, and yet we're still struggling to look at it from the top down and say, well, really, we've got to make a seminal move here. The big gain is reduced diabetes levels, therefore reduced NHS spend. Until we grasp that nettle, the amount of money funding into sport, I suspect, is going to remain too low. Moving on, I mean, similar topic, I only talked about the Netherlands there and go on to talk about the, the Manchester Wellbeing Project. But I just wanted to just, in, before that, just look at the Family Foundation, the Gregson Family Foundation, and, and what kind of your purpose. I know that you've got one of, one of your major studies there, but are you okay to just expand a little bit on the, sure. on the foundation? Yeah, no, thank you. But well, firstly, we're men of straw, so don't, I don't want your listeners to get the impression this is a significant charitable enterprise, but it, it is important to me and my family. And we've put a significant amount of the money that we have into it. But in the, in the great scheme of things, it's not going to move the dial. There are three areas to it. And I've touched on them, I think, earlier on uh, when we were speaking, which is the environment, young people, and social justice. And my interest in well-being of young people was one of the themes when we set up the foundation that we started to develop. And I looked at not only the physical activity levels that I've just described to you, and the amount of money that was spent in the Netherlands and other countries, but I also looked at just pure well-being levels. And there are some internationally recognized um, surveys done, which produce very consistent results. And they show that the young people in Britain are the fourth least satisfied with their lives of the 80 countries surveyed in the PISA survey, which is the gold standard, and the Dutch are the happiest. Are these countries, I guess, Western countries or first world mixture? Yeah. It'll include all the it'll include all the Western European countries, includes the US, includes Canada. So it includes all the Westernized countries, but it'll include others as well. So 80 countries. There are 200 members of the UN, so it's not all countries, but it's a significant proportion of them. And there is no excuse for a developed economy like the UK to be fourth bottom. And so I sort of started to work out, well, why is it that the Dutch are the, have the happiest kids in the world? And why is it that we've got the fourth least happy? And of course, again, like many of these things, it's incredibly complex and nobody can really pin it down to one thing. It will include some of the things that we talked about, which is physical activity levels in the Netherlands and the availability of the sports facilities and how they're managed and their relationship to schools. I mean, there's a whole raft of, of elements, elements there. But there's also inequality, vast differences in equality levels. Anyway, it led me to, when I looked at it and how the Dutch made their children so happy and why it was that ours were unhappy, there was one thing that stood out to me that we've sought to use in Greater Manchester, and that is that the Dutch believe a happy child is a learning child. So they don't assess and measure schools by how well they do in their exams they assess and measure schools as to whether the children are satisfied with their lives. So they think completely the other way around to us. And I'm not saying that the British, given the vast cultural differences with the Dutch, should do the same, but I do think we should give much greater weight to well-being. 100%. I can't, it escapes me the country, but I read something recently about that measurement. So obviously GDP measurement for the country is almost a success measurement. They have happiness score, the measurement for that and obviously it's a smaller country it's Bhutan. Bhutan so I just feel like it kind of resonates right if they're doing that for the children if you expand it to the wider society then you can make some more positive development yeah and actually funny enough I co-funded a survey with the Youth Sport Trust about a month ago and we asked 2,000 parents what were the criteria by which they chose 
secondary school for their child. And, you know, in a system that is dominated by academic attainment, you'd expect academic attainment to be top. But it actually wasn't. It was fifth or sixth. And the well-being and life satisfaction of their child was the most important. So that's the same as the Dutch. It's just that the Dutch have moved their system to accommodate that. And we're still not. Yeah, I guess it's what almost what gets measured gets improved, right? So whatever you focus, if you're focusing on that as the metric, then everything's going to be around it. So hopefully, hopefully influence. In terms of the project, so the Manchester Wellbeing Project, so what's the format? I don't know it's a wide range of study, but what's the kind of format, the timelines? Are we impact? I'm assuming it's been impacted by COVID and whatever's been going on. But yeah, can you expand on it for us? Yeah, well, it's been in terms of the program, in some respects, it's In a way, it's distressing to say in many respects, it's been positively impacted by COVID because I think there is now much greater recognition than there was pre the pandemic that the well-being of young people is paramount. And even though we started pre-pandemic, you know, it's very much of the moment now because people are worried about the mental health. They are worried about the broader life chances of young people in a way that they weren't even two years ago. It has been delayed. So we'll be launching our three-year program in the autumn. And it would have been earlier than that if it hadn't been for the pandemic. We've raised more money than we expected. So we'll do it better than we thought we would because people are now recognizing this is important. And we will try and inspire 267 secondary schools across Greater Manchester to do a half-hour survey that we will provide to them of young people in years 8 to 10. And we'll do that for three consecutive years. And we will provide the feedback privately to the schools themselves so that they can act on whatever they learn from that. And we have a clear feedback mechanism for that. But perhaps most importantly, in relation to this conversation, if we get as many of those 267 schools as we possibly can, we will be able to publish transparently information by six. So we'll be able to map it. And it'll then become nothing to do with the school. It'll become something to do with the neighborhood and the locality and the amount of ground green space that is where they live. Because, of course, they're at school for lots of their time, but they're in their communities for the rest of their time. And that's the bit I think that we miss out on in what is a young person's life. And then having created that data, as we hope to do, we're then creating a coalition of actors who will undertake to act upon that neighborhood data. And that includes, in Greater Manchester already, that includes the Manchester United Foundation, City and the Community. So we've got both major football clubs. You know, it'll be, we hope, Lancashire Cricket Club, maybe the Sale Sharks, and lots of sort of physical activity clubs, sported. I know you've interviewed Nicola Walker, you know, with all the community clubs. There's a very important physical activity element to it, but it won't be just physical activity. It'll be arts and culture. It'll be youth clubs more generally. And trying to create this notion that the well-being of young people is everybody's business. It's not just the business of schools. It's not just the business of parents and families. It's everybody's business. Do you think, so this is the survey starting in September, I'm just thinking potentially, I guess your baseline is going to be a bit skewed from all the children coming out down and all that phase, so probably skewed downwards. So I don't know if you think that'll make a significant, almost a challenge, or do you think it's going to skew the data at all? Or do I don't know if it? it'll skew the data, but it'll certainly, you know, so long as the young people answer honestly, it will give us the baseline. I mean, the reality is the reality. We may feel it's skewed downwards from where it might have been two or three years ago, but if it's the reality, it's what we've got to deal with. And uh, so, you know, physical activity levels, which I know is something of interest to this particular audience, physical activity levels in the pandemic, as we know, for young people have declined very sharply. Well, that's the reality. And we have to draw that out. And we then have to inspire this coalition of physical activity actors to do something about it. Uh, Really, really interesting to see how the results come out and also i think it's almost if they are shocking but if they are really low in terms of activity levels then it's going to help with agitating people to do something about it right important that's the point that's the point and you know we in fully intend to publish nationally what we're going to discover in greater manchester and i think it'll open a lot of eyes because one of the things that i notice and it's very hard to do so it's easy to observe we do look at data in silos you know, because we have government departments and they have their own responsibilities. And of course, that's natural. But when you look at a young person's life, you can't segregate it into little bits and bobs. That is their life. And I think that one of the things that we will do in, in Greater Manchester is provide that holistic picture 
which for me, we haven't quite yet managed to draw out in our country just yet. And that might be one of the really big wins for us. Just a quick one, our curiosity in terms of the selection of Manchester, is that due to your ties with the university, etc.? Is it kind of a demographic, the ideal demographic location for the study? Or Another great question. I did think about Birmingham and I did think about Manchester. And I suppose that one of the advantages that Manchester has, part, it, first of all, it's big. It's not quite as big as Birmingham. But even so, in Greater Manchester, it's three million people. So it's certainly big enough. Obviously, I've got my ties through having been at the university and being on the business school, so that was helpful. It's got significant social issues to address, so there's a very big need to address these issues, and the combined authority in all the local, the 10 local districts recognise that. And I suppose there's one other really fundamental point, which is that Manchester is the only major city in Britain, certainly England, that has a devolved healthcare budget. So the combined authority controls all of the levers, including health. And that is different to every other city in Britain, including Birmingham. And I think that was the other factor. And of course, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact we have in Andy Burnham, which is not to talk about any other mayor, but certainly in the case of Andy Burnham, this agenda is right in his heartland. So he's embraced it with an enthusiasm. Indeed, he did a thing called the Life Readiness, he and colleagues did a thing called the Life Readiness Survey before we approached him on this one. So he was all slightly, already slightly ahead of the game. Perfect fit then. That sounds good. Okay, so just moving away from that slightly, we're always trying to ask our guests about any gems, really, gems of insights from you uh, on your journey and, and sitting on all, all these different boards and working on all these different organisations and, and seeing how they operate. Do you have any, have you ever kind of developed any philosophies on business or leadership that you kind of deploy when you're going into a new project or just day to day? Yeah, well, we're all victims of our own experience, aren't we? And so I'm no different to anybody else in that respect. But, but I think when it comes to what I've learned about what makes a really successful enterprise, whether that's you know social enterprise, whether that's a company, just in the way that you've set up coordinate sport, there are various ingredients that go into successful enterprise. It's in my experience, and they would include focus, really knowing what you're good at, and really focusing on what you're good at, not being distracted, alignment of interests in the various stakeholders. And we're seeing much more of that these days with a move towards purpose across business. Uh, So aligning the interest, the purpose of employees with the purpose of a business alignment. I think horizon scanning, we've touched on that in the education system, you know, what's it going to look like in 10, 15, 20 years, the really good businesses really look into the future. And by that, we're not just talking about a three year plan, we're talking about a 10 year and maybe a 20 year vision, it will be wrong, but at least you're thinking out of the box. Obviously, leadership, the quality of leadership is the one that really differentiates great enterprises from less great enterprises. But ultimately, the one that really overarches them all is culture. And maybe that's where we started with Phoenix. You know, I described how we built up a culture at Phoenix, which reflected who we were. And I think you can see that in businesses and enterprises that the the culture of an organization actually trumps any strategy. And there's a great phrase, which is culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I'd say it eats it for breakfast, lunch and dinner. So those are the five things that I've learned about what makes great enterprise. Great. And in terms of you personally, I know it seems like just from my introduction, so much going on. How do you tend to stay on top of everything to be able to be kind of working at uh, high performing and mentally on top of everything that's going on do you have any habits and things that you do well i think i suspect my habits are not ones that anybody <laughs> listening to this course would ever seek to and my wife would certainly say that i'm a very hard worker i'm very driven and i'm very driven for all the reasons that you unearthed earlier in this call because of all the privilege that I feel I've had and wanting to put back and make a difference. So I do work incredibly hard. I mean, I work six or seven days a week, but I love what I do. And I think that's what comes just as you probably do at Coordinate Sport. You know, if you love what you do, the difference between work and the rest of your life becomes really all the same. Yeah, exactly. quite minimal. Yeah, they're all the same. And you probably feel that yourself. And and so I'm the same with that, too. However, you know, I could imagine that others looking at my lifestyle would say, well, you should give yourself more time, you should well being and, you know, so I do look, I do all the things that I preach, you know, I take lots of physical activity, I do go out for long walks, I do all that spend lots of time with my family. Do I get the balance right all the time? Probably not, I guess. I think that's the Well, everyone's battling with that challenge, aren't they? Work life balance. Finally, I really want to be respectful of your time. We always ask a question based on on hindsight, basically, if you could go back in time 
back to when you started out your career, give yourself some advice, maybe 21 years old. What would you go back and, um, and tell yourself? Well, I think what I'd tell myself is what young people are telling themselves today in a way that I never told myself. And what I've learned through this Manchester program by asking young people what's important today, it's that they know themselves. And that's been an incredible revelation to me that a 14, 15 or 16 year old would consider that to be the most important thing for them at this stage of their lives. I'm so impressed. I didn't know myself at the age of 21. I didn't follow what I could have followed. I followed, as I described you, something of a slightly preordained path. So I would go back to my 21-year-old and say, follow your dreams. And I think this generation is going to do that. And I'm going to do my very, very best to assist them to achieve that. That's I yeah, love that one. I think we found our intro clip there. David, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Real privilege speaking to you. And in terms of getting in touch with you or watching what you're doing and following you. We'll, we'll add everything in, in the show notes if anyone wants to see what you're up to and see and get, get in touch. But yeah, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Well, if I can thank you, because I actually have to say that time went in a flash and we went over the 45 minutes, but you're a very, very good questioner, if I may say. And I, the reason I say that is because you listen. You know, I've done loads of podcasts and quite often people don't listen to what you're saying because they've got those sort of preordained questions. Yeah, do you know, we have, we have some questions, there are some areas to speak about, but I think for me, it was, it's almost, you've done so much, I was just trying to pick out the things that I think potentially the listeners be interested in, and then also I'm getting interested in things you're saying, so I was trying to, trying to jump on that at the same time. Well, it's a great credit to you. So I thoroughly enjoyed it, James, and I, I think you're really good at it. Thank you for listening to this week's show. You can subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can write to us at dryphase.podcast at coordinate.cloud, tweet us at coordinate sport, or follow us on Instagram at coordinate underscore sports, or on my account at james underscore ventures. This episode was produced by Nancy Kwamboka, with support from Claire Goodchild and Lola Small, with special thanks to Rochelle. I'm James Moore, and you've been listening to The Drive Phase from Coordinate Sport.